السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي الرحمة والهدى محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his entire household, all his companions, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of them and every one of us, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us paradise and jannah. My brothers and sisters, a great companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from al Madina al munawwara by the name of Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas radiyallahu an. He was a man whom, when Mus'ab ibn Umair radiyallahu an was sent to al Madina al munawwara in order to teach the people who had accepted Islam from Medina, the Quran and the teachings of Islam, and in order to answer the questions of those who had questions regarding Islam from amongst the people of the book who lived in Medina and the others, one of those who constantly heard the verses of the Quran being recited by Mus'ab ibn Umair was a man known as Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas, later to be known as radiyallahu an. So he says, I used to listen to this beautiful voice, read the Quran in the Arabic language. And this Quran had such a power in it that it struck my heart. And in a few days, I declared that I was from amongst the followers of this beautiful Quran. I went to Mus'ab ibn Umair and I declared my shahada, the declaration of faith and became a Muslim. So he became a Muslim in the early stages in Medina Munawwara just before the hijra as you know when Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu was sent to al Madinah al munawwara so this man the day the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and abu bakr as-siddiq radiallahu anhum anhu when they arrived in Medina munawwara thabit ibn qais ibn shimas was the one appointed by the ansar which means the people of Medina to speak to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, address him on their behalf. Because he was very eloquent. He had a nice voice. He spoke well, clear, loud. And at the same time, he drew the attention of the people. Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas radiallahu an. So he got up, he welcomed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was in a large group of people who were welcoming Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He addressed him, O Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he spoke for a while. From amongst what he said, or part of what he said was, that we will protect you from whatever we protect ourselves and our offspring from. And we will grant you whatever we grant ourselves. Consider you one of us. And so on. And then he asks, what will we have in return? Good question. What will we have in return? This was already confirmed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa previously when they pledged the Aqaba allegiance in the Hajj of the previous two years. But it was repeated in the presence of everyone. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, if you do that, in return you will get paradise. One word, al-jannah. Al-jannah meaning you get paradise for serving Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So immediately they they said collectively, Radina Ya Rasulallah, Radina Ya Rasulallah, we are happy with that, O Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are happy with that, O Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam noticed that this man was very eloquent. And later on, he was made the one who was a spokesman of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khatibu Rasulillah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when delegations came from outside or people came from different uh, towns and different villages and so on to meet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam or even just to have a so-called speech contest which they used to constantly have at that time you know they used to have speech contests because they were unlettered most of them and they used to compete with one another who can speak better who has better speech it was at its peak so when the delegations used to come from afar, the Prophet ﷺ had two people whom he appointed. One was for poetry and one was for lecturing. The one for lecturing was our, our hero that we are speaking about today, Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas radiallahu an, And the one who was the poet of Muhammad ﷺ was Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu an. So when the people came, some of these lectures, the brief ones are recorded in history, how this man spoke, how eloquent he was, how he really always 
spoke far better than the others who had come. Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas radiyallahu an. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once found Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas very sad. He was seated on his own and he was not talking much and he was looking like, you know, a person who was in worry, deep thought. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks him, O oh, Thabit, what is the problem? Now he was a man who was eloquent, he was well known, he had a loud voice, mashallah. He was the spokesman of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and at the same time, subhanallah, he had an amazing character. He had concern for his own deeds and his well-being. So he says, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I think I have suffered a great loss. What is the loss that you have suffered? He says, I heard the verses that were revealed to you. And these are verses of Surah Luqman. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yuhibbu kulla mukhtalin fakhoor. Allah does not like those who are boastful, self-conceited, those who are proud, and so on. That's the meaning of the verse in Surah Luqman. So this man Thabit ibn Qais says, When I heard that verse, I felt that I am the one being addressed and I am at loss. The reason is, I love my dress, I love my conveyance, and I like to look well, and I speak well, and I like to be a person who presents himself well. So the Prophet ﷺ says, O oh, Thabit, you are not from amongst those. So he made it quite clear that for a person to, be, to take pride in their dress, and that's what we would call it in the English language, to take pride in their dress, does not make them proud or boastful or self-conceited. No, you dress appropriately, no problem. For you to have the best vehicle on earth, no problem. For you to have the most luxurious items, no problem, on condition that it does not turn you away from Allah, number one, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it does not make you a person who despises others and rejects the truth. Because in another narration, Muhammad sallallahu was asked, by his companions when he said la yadkhulul jannata man kana fi qalbihi mithqala habbatin min khardalin min kibr he says no one will enter paradise if in their heart there is even a mustard seed's weight worth of pride so the mes the, the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked by his companions that o oh, rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam what about if we like our conveyance and our clothing and we take pride in it and so on? He said, that is not what is pride. Pride is when you reject the truth and you despise people. So you despise people. This one is nothing. That one is nothing. You know, I am the only one. That is pride. And when the truth comes to you and you reject it, that is also pride. This is the description of pride in Islam. But to be wearing good clothing, to have a good scent, good perfume, good motor vehicle, and to have, you know, uh, as we would say, to take a little bit of pride in your clothing. In the English language, when we use that, it does not have a bad meaning. Like we say, we are proud to be Muslim. It does not mean we are arrogant to be Muslim. No, it actually means we are happy to be Muslim. But that's the English language. The words do not actually mean the same thing in the English language and the Arabic language. So this man was so happy thereafter. But there was another instance where he stopped mixing. And he did not come to the, to the gathering of Muhammad sallallahu as much as he did again. So he used to take things quite personally. Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas radiyallahu an. So again Muhammad sallallahu when he noticed this man is absent, he only comes for salah and he goes away. So he sent someone, he said, will anyone find out what's wrong with this man? Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas radiyallahu an. So one of the companions says, I will find out. So he went and he saw Thabit ibn Qais sitting very sad in his own home. He asked him, oh Thabit, what's the problem? Again, he says, I've suffered a great loss. I think all my deeds that I've done, the good deeds have been wasted. So he was asked, how can your good deeds have been wasted? So he said, I heard a verse being revealed, the verses of Surah Al-Hujurat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَرْفَعُوا أَصْوَاتَكُمْ فَوْقَ صَوْتِ النَّبِيِّ وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ كَجَهْرِ بَعْضِكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ أَنْ تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ أَنْ تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ 
It says, O oh, you who believe, do not you raise your voice above the voice of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and do not address him like you would be addressing one another. The messenger deserves respect sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You address him with utmost respect. When he speaks, remain silent. You do not raise your voice above his, lest your deeds shall be wasted and you won't even know. Which means that if you do this, perhaps your deeds might be lost and they might turn against you. All your good deeds will be wiped out without you knowing because of the evil you've done. So Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shima says, you know, I'm a man with a loud voice. I speak a lot and I'm always very high in volume and I'm worried this is about me. So he went back to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, this is what Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas has said. So then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam calls for Thabit ibn Qais. And then when he asked him once again and he repeated what his concern was, he says, oh Thabit, wouldn't you like to be a person who lives a good life and who is martyred in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who enters paradise? So he said, yes, indeed, I would like that. He says, inshallah, you have that. So this was a prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to say that this man, he will lead a life, a good life. And at the same time, he will be martyred. And at the same time, he will be from amongst those who has earned paradise or who will be given paradise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas, although he was not one of the 10 who was conferred paradise in the one gathering of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he was from amongst a large group of others who were also told that you are from paradise. One of them was Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas radiallahu anhu, the Ansari from Medina Munawwara, the one who was very eloquent and spoke very well. So this was his concern. Now, it's amazing how this man, one day, and this is something we have to learn from, we, something we have a great lesson from. One day his wife comes to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, one of his wives, and says, Oh, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Thabit is a good man. I'm married to him. I am not complaining about his character or his religion, but I do not want to remain married to him. Subhanallah. Did you hear this? I don't want to remain married to him. Whatever the reason was, I don't want to remain. Now, what happened is, there was a trial to see how best this marriage could work. But it arrived such at a, at a point where the man wanted to remain married. But the woman did not want. She said, look, I'm not complaining about the man. But I don't want to be his wife anymore. So do you know what happened? Imagine, what would the messenger peace be upon him do? after trying to convince her and after trying to see what the matter was and still we are at a stagnant point where we are achieving nothing. She still wants out. That's what it was. Literally, she wants out of the marriage. What's your reason? I have no reason. I just want out. Subhanallah. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told her and this is something we all have to learn a lesson from. He says, okay, he gave you an orchard when he married you. Are you ready to give the orchard back? The orchard was something big. She said, yes, I'm ready to give it back. So he called Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas. He says, take the orchard and give her one talaq. Divorce her. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And they lived happily in the sense that no bitterness, no, nothing to say, oh, you know, this is what happened. Nobody actually complained and whinged. In fact, the laws of what we know as khula were made clear by this hadith, which is in Sahih al-Bukhari. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a lesson. So it was Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas, the same man, what a powerful man. And his wife was granted what she wanted. She had to give back the mahar and she got the divorce in return. So there are three main ways, in fact, four ways that a woman is divorced in Islam. The first is when a divorce is issued by the man. The second is when she has valid reason and she goes to a court, shari court, or a panel of scholars who has been uh, appointed to nullify marriages, and she has the reason, they will look into it, they will address the man, they will see if they can solve the problem. If they cannot, they will award her a divorce, whether he likes it or not. That's in Islam. A lot of people don't know this. So she can actually go out and ask for a divorce and she will get it. Because you cannot oppress a woman. If you are oppressing her, she has the right to seek out and to get a divorce without your interference. And the third way of doing it is, if she has no reason whatsoever, she can actually return what you've given her 
and this would only be if you agree, if a man agrees, to take back the, the mahar that was given and to issue in return what is known as a divorce of khula. Khula meaning you are actually withdrawing now after you have been given back what you gave her in mahar. And for this reason, there are some people who have very high mahar. You know what is mahar? The, the, the gift that you, the, the groom gives the bride. Some communities have a very high figure that they ask for. And then they say, you know what? You only give it to her if you divorce her. May Allah grant us ease. That's not the right way of doing things, my brothers and sisters. And it's not even correct to have high dowries. In Islam, the simplicity is in the dowry that is token, not something that is big in figures. Although it's permissible to ask for whatever you want, but subhanallah, if there is something simple done with the correct intentions, inshallah, there is greater barakah in that particular marriage. So this was Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas. I've mentioned three ways. The fourth way, if a person happens to accuse his wife of adultery in the presence of a court and in the presence of witnesses and swears the oath that is a specific type of an oath and they went through what is known as li'an or mula'ana. It is some specific way of accusing a spouse in the presence of certain number of people and so on and a certain number of times. In that case, the divorce automatically takes place and the two can no longer be together because it's something serious and big. But remember, it would happen if this accusation occurs in the presence of the, the, those who are appointed to listen to that type of accusation. Still, we are prohibited from accusing one another of having slept with this one and did this with that one. These are grave statements that we should abstain from, stay away from. This is something we learn, or the issue of khula, we learn it from Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas al-Ansari radiyallahu an. Then he was a man who took part in most of the battles besides Badr. He says almost all the battles and the visits of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, after Badr. He took part in a lot of these. And what happened with this man is he passed away in Yamama. Yamama at the time of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, when they went to fight Musaylamah, the, the, the liar who was saying that he is the messenger and so on. And this man, how he fought was amazing. He brought back memories of the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was martyred in the battle together with Salim, Mawla, Abi Hudayfa, radiyallahu anhu. So when he was martyred, something unique happened. This is one of the stories that I need to make mention of here because it is something that the books have mentioned and the scholars have said it is a true story. When he was martyred, the following day, he came in the dream of one of the new Muslims. He came in the dream of one of the companions or one of the new Muslims. And... In the dream, he tells this man that when I died, when I was martyred yesterday, my armor was taken by a certain man and he hid it in a certain place. You need to get that. Inform Khalid ibn al-Walid, who's the leader of the army, and you need to get that armor, number one. Number two is, I owe this person and this person some money. When you go back to Medina, you need to make sure that this amount is paid from what is mine. So the man woke up. And he was surprised. And subhanallah, it is reported that when he went to Khalid ibn al-Walid, radiallahu anhu, telling him, I saw a dream last night. And Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas, who was martyred yesterday, told me to tell you that this is what it is. Khalid ibn al-Walid, radiallahu anhu, says, let's go and check. So they sent some men. They checked and they saw the armor exactly where it was described in the dream, number one. Number two is when they got back to Medina Munawwara, they met with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, and they confirmed with the people who were owed money according to the dream and it turned out to be exactly correct. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson from this. These are the saints. These are the true heroes of the deen. Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shimas radiallahu an. May Allah bless him and bless us all. The second hero we, are, we have this evening, subhanallah, is a powerful person, a powerful person who was known as the Roman, Suhaib, the Roman, but he was not from Rome, subhanallah. So why did they call him the Roman? Suhaib ibn Sinan ibn Malik al-Rumi, radiyallahu an. That was his name. Suhaib ibn Sinan ibn Malik al-Rumi. Rumi means the Roman, but he was nowhere from Rome. Number one, he looked very Caucasian. He had red skin and ginger hair. Subhanallah. 
He was a little boy. His father was the chief appointed by the Persian emperors in a place in Iraq known as Al-Ubullah. So his father was the chief. And one day the Roman army came in to attack. Now there were wars that took place between the Romans and the Persians. That's even mentioned in the Quran, the beginning of Surah Al-Rum. So what happened is, when this war took place, the, the Romans conquered the area where Suhaib ibn Sinan's dad, who was known as Sinan ibn Malik, was the chief of. They conquered it and they took a lot of the property and they took the wealth and they got hold of the children and some of the women and they went away with them. They took them as slaves. And they took this youngster who was a very good looking boy back with them to where they were, the Roman Empire, subhanallah. So he went back to Rome with them or somewhere under their rule. So this youngster, he became a slave and he was sold from one to another. Someone offered a higher price. They paid, they were given him and he went, he served them for a while and he went to another and a third. And it is reported that means Sayyidin ila Sayyid. He went from one to another, subhanallah. So now what happened with him is he always knew that I come from the Arabs. I'm an Arab. He was an Arab, pure Arab, subhanallah. And he always knew one day I'm going to somehow get back to my place. He always knew it in his heart. But he worked hard, dedicated, and the people loved him because he was a very good child that they loved to look at. And at the same time, he was of good character and good manners because he was the son of a leader. Subhanallah. I hope and I pray the children of our leaders also can be exemplary. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them good qualities and us all and our children as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them qualities of leadership such that when they interact with people, they can immediately realize that this person has been groomed correctly. I mean, I mean, and may that happen for us as well. Sometimes we as adults, really the way we speak to people and the way we carry ourselves, we need a lot of panel beating my brothers and sisters. May Allah grant that to us and may he make us exemplary people. So Suhaib ibn Sinan says, one day as I was cleaning, I used to see and I used to watch how filthy and dirty the Romans were. I used to see how they used to do things. And I used to look at it and say, oh, these people, they are so filthy in their habits. And at the same time, they have so much of deception even amongst them that it is something that he was beginning to become fed up of. And one day he heard one of the older uh, leaders of the church, one of the older leaders of the church, telling another person that you know what in Makkah it's about time that there is going to be a messenger who is going to declare that he is completing the message of Jesus may peace be upon him Isa alayhi salatu was salam and he will come to confirm whatever is in the Bible and the Torah and he is going to bring forth goodness and remove his people from darkness to light so this youngster heard it and he says oh I, I'm an Arab meaning in, to himself he said I'm an Arab I come from there I will go back there one day and I want to meet this man and I want to see it because now as much as he loved to go back to the Arabian Peninsula this thing made him even more keen to go back so it is reported that one day either he ran away and he you know went on his own meaning with a caravan or he was sold to certain people who came from Mecca so one of the two the story is not very clear but a lot of the narrations make mention of how he, he ran away. He actually went away one day. He was a free boy anyway. So when he went, he ended up in Makkah to Al-Mukarramah at the hands of Abdullah ibn Jad'an. Now, Abdullah ibn Jad'an, we've heard this name a lot. He was a person who, at the period of ignorance, he found a great treasure. And he asked one of the leaders or one of the wise people, what should I do with the treasure that I found? You know, should I bury it what should i do so many different options he had so the wise man tells him do you know what the best thing is be kind to the people and give charity to the people if you give charity you'll have a long life now what is the meaning of if you give charity you'll have a long life what it meant at that time was if you give a charity people will remember you after you've died so it will have helped you a lot they'll say oh that man rahmatullahi alayhi they'll give you five or ten du'as one time so they remember your name you gave a lot of charity so Abdullah ibn Jad'an decided to start freeing slaves. He would give people big gifts, huge gifts that they could not believe that this has come. Where did it come from? Abdullah ibn Jad'an. Subhanallah. Amazing. And even when there was a conference to be held, when one of the men was oppressed from abroad, it was held at the house of Abdullah ibn Jad'an, known as Hilful Fudul. It was something unique. 
it was a, a, a pledge that they had agreed in to actually assist those who were oppressed who came from abroad. There was a man who arrived in Mecca and he said, the people of Quraysh have stolen my wealth. It was Abdullah ibn Jad'an who got up to help him because he was a very wealthy man. So he was known basically as the wealthy and the generous at that time. So it is reported that this man Suhaib al-Rumi as a young boy, he fell into the hands of Abdullah ibn Jad'an somehow. And at some stage he was freed by Abdullah ibn Jad'an and he started to do some business. But he was under the protection of Abdullah ibn Jad'an because he was not known. The people used to call him Roman because he could not really speak Arabic because he grew up in Rome. And at the same time, when he started speaking the Arabic language, he had a very distinct foreign accent. You know, I don't want to imitate or mimic it here right now, but you can imagine people come from far when they want to speak, even when they read the Quran, you can tell this person is trying very hard, but it's not so easy on the tongue. The tongue is a bit hard, so to speak. May Allah make it easy for us all to read the Quran. I mean, so my brothers and sisters, they knew they used to call him the Roman, Suhaib, the Roman. It's reported that his name was not even Suhaib initially, but the Romans called him Suhaib. So he was known as Suhaib. So he started doing business. And one day he heard people talking about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hey, there's a messenger and he's come. And this is what he's saying. He was so excited because that's what he was waiting for. Even though he became a wealthy person, but he was never ever oblivious of the fact that there is going to be a messenger coming in Mecca, according to what I was told when I was in Rome, subhanallah. So what happened is he tiptoed. He asked a question, where is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So someone told him, watch out, be careful, don't ask loudly because you're going to be harmed by Quraysh and as it is, you've got no relatives here. You are a foreigner and a stranger. You were a slave now then the other day. So he says, but where is he? He says, He's, he will be found in the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam radiallahu an. What a man, subhanallah. Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam radiallahu an. So at night, he tiptoed to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam and guess who he finds at the door? Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu an. So he looks at Ammar and they knew each other. He says, Ammar, what are you doing at this door? Ammar says, what are you doing at this door? Wow, mashallah. This happened quite often at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where people were too scared to tell each other initially what they wanted. But later on it came out. So Ammar says, what, would, what are you doing here? So Suhaib ibn Sinan, ibn Malik, al-Rumi radiallahu an, he says, you know what? I want to listen to this man, see what he has to say. Ammar ibn Yasir says, yes, me too, radiallahu anhuma. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. So they knocked on the door. And believe me, the narrations make mention of how the wooden door that was opened, they took one step into the door and that was to change their entire lives. So sometimes my brothers and sisters, one small step towards Allah will change your whole life. This is why do not underestimate the small steps that are taken in life. Perhaps that might be the step that will grant you paradise. My brothers and sisters, do not underestimate a little change in you. Even if it is one millimeter of a change, perhaps that might be your journey to Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala soften our hearts and may he grant us that change. So my brothers and sisters, they walked through this, th that door, a small wooden door, and they sat in the company of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa for a few minutes, listening to the Quran and what he had to say. They declared their shahada, both of them, Ammar ibn Yasir, Suhaib ibn Sinan, al-Rumi. And this man was attacked, just like the others. He was harmed because he was a foreigner. There was no one to protect him. So much so, they did not allow him to go for hijrah. And yet, they told him, you were a man who came to us. When you came to us, you were poor. You had nothing. Now you started doing business and you've got gold and silver and you become wealthy and look at what you're doing to us. You've become a traitor. You don't even appreciate that we are the ones who made you rich. You know, we put you on the map basically. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Look at the statements of Quraysh. Fadl and virtue come from Allah, not from me or from you. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us through the story of Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi. When Quraysh told him you became rich because of us, he did not leave Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They punished him. They abused him verbally, physically, even economically. They tried to harm him, to usurp his wealth, and they blocked him making the hijrah. So much so that Suhaib ibn Sinan ibn Malik al-Rumi radiallahu anhu says, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was leaving for the hijrah with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, I was supposed to be the third person. 
I wanted to be the third person, but Quraysh blocked me. They stopped me. I couldn't. It just didn't happen. So he decided now Muhammad وسلم, has left and most of the people have gone for the hijrah. I am one of those who remain behind. I need to do something. So Quraysh had surrounded his house as well and sent people to watch him 24 7 literally throughout the day and night. So he decides, you know what? Let me pretend like I have loose bowels. Allahu Akbar. He ran out. You see, the loo was not like what we have today. We call it ensuite. You know, the room is here and the loo is right in the room. No. At that time, the, the loos were outside the house. Up to now, in some rural areas across the, across the globe, you find that the, the loo or the bathing facility is somewhere further away. So at that time, it was the same. So Suhaib ibn Sinan, ibn Malik al-Rumi, radiyallahu an, he decided to come out and use the loo. And he took so long. So the, those who were watching him, they watched him from afar. And they saw, no, this man is actually, he's, at, he's in the loo. He went back to his room. And a little while later, he came back. They watched him again. He went back and a little while later, he came back. So they said, wow, our gods, the idols are punishing this man. Look, his stomach is now, you know, calling the shots, basically. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all good bellies. I mean. So, so subhanallah, this man went and he came back. He went and he came back. Until these people said, no, he's really suffering a spate of diarrhea perhaps. And what happened is, they decided, okay, let's go and sleep. As they slept, he went away. He made his hijrah. He was gone. But what happened? They got up a few hours later, some time later, and they noticed the man has absconded. So immediately they decided, let's jump onto the quickest of horses we have and catch up with him. Because he has a lot of gold and silver and he has so much of wealth. This man was rich. So they ran after him or they rushed after him. And he had got to the top of a certain mount, a slightly high area. And he saw them. And so they made an, he made an announcement to them. He says, Ya Ma'ashara Quraysh, O people of Quraysh, you are running after me. You know that I am a very good marksman. And I've got so many spears here. Every one of you who's trying to come here with one spear, one of you will go. So you'd, you'd better watch because I'm at a high place. As you come close, I'm warning you. So anyway, they kept there. They spoke to him and they said they started calling for help to say, you know what? We need backup here. There's one man who's wanted here and we want backup. We need to take him back to Mecca. So he says, do you know what? What is it that I can do that you let me go? I don't want anything. They said, no, you're a man. You were, you were very poor when you came. Where is all the wealth you made? He says, okay. I can leave Makkah just as I entered Makkah. Listen to this. When he came, he had nothing. He says, I'm prepared to leave with nothing. I've hidden my wealth somewhere. I will tell you where it is. You go and get it. It's all yours. And leave me to go to Medina. Would you agree? They said, yes, yes, yes. We agree straight away. You know, they say you put money, anyone takes it. There's a figure. There's a price. You know, if someone says, will you do this? I pay you five ringgit. Say no. 50 ringgit. No. 50 million ringgit. Uh... Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us agree to that which is wrong. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So my brothers and sisters, the man told them where his wealth was. They went, they found it, they let him go. He arrived in Medina Munawwara at Quba where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa looks at him and says, Oh Suhaib, Rabbi Halbay, Rabbi Halbay, your deal that you struck is definitely profitable. So he looks, he says, how do you know about the deal? Jibreel alayhi salam had come and informed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa already that your man Suhaib is on his way and this is what has happened to him. Every single droplet he had was usurped by Quraysh, gone. He, when he traveled, it took him so long. He struggled even with food and drink. He was thirsty, but he made it to Quba. And the Prophet sallallahu looked at him and the Suhaib smiled so broad when he heard this. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses regarding Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi radiyallahu anhu. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ بْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ From amongst the people is he who has sold himself in order to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Mufassireen say this is referring to Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi radiyallahu anhu, the man who left everything in order to join Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was a man who witnessed all the battles after that with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The battle starting from Badr, going all the way down. 
He says, I never ever missed a single battle with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know what? At the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, something unique happened. When Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was stabbed by Abdurrahman ibn Muljim, if you recall, we made mention of it. The first thing Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu did, that was salah, he was stabbed in salah. He said, the one who will take over now as the interim leader, Suhaib ibn Sinan ibn Malik al-Khazraji, uh, sorry, al-Rumi radiallahu anhu. Suhaib ibn Sinan ibn Malik al-Rumi, this man, the Roman, will take over. So he was the imam of the Muslims. He led them in prayer for the interim period, the few days between Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu's death and the day that Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was appointed the Khalifa. In fact, the day Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was stabbed and the day Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was appointed Khalifa. The man in the interim was this man, Suhaib ibn Sinan ibn Malik al-Rumi radiyallahu anhu. He passed away in Medina Munawwara at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu and he is buried in Baqi'. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them all Jannah and may he unite us with them. What beautiful men, what powerful stories, what great sacrifice, what great heroes and role models. May we be from amongst those who learn a lesson from these. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayki.